Good morning, this is Adeline Vanderer of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's my pleasure to talk to you this morning about how to approach diagnosis in leukodystrophies in 2020. Before I get started, I'd like to provide my disclosures. I receive grant and in-kind support for translational research without personal compensation from Eli Lilly, Gilead, Takeda, Illumina, Biogen, Homology, Ionis, Passage Bio, and Orchard Therapeutic. I also serve on the scientific advisory board of several of our foundation partners and our industry partners on an unpaid capacity. Before we start speaking about how to diagnose leukodystrophies, it's important to identify what we think leukodystrophies are. Several years ago, a number of my peers got together to define in uh, epidemiologic case description format a, uh, what might be considered a leukodystrophy. And the consensus was that leukodystrophies were heritable disorders affecting the white matter of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system that required a predominance of glial or myelin sheath abnormality. They distinguished on a radiologic basis between hypomyelinating leukodystrophies versus demyelinating leukodystrophies, and they excluded disorders that had not have primary glial or myelin sheath abnormalities, um, and that could be either genetic or acquired in etiology. At the time, in 2015, this left us with a list of 30 disorders. New disorders are being identified daily that might fit this definition, but the case description has not been updated. From a conceptual perspective, however, it's important to realize that in addition to those canonical leukodystrophies, which might be on a, a panel, for example, there are many, many more genetic uh, disorders that can cause a patient to present to your clinic with white matter abnormalities on an MRI. And these might include disorders with inborn errors of metabolism that are not typically considered leukodystrophies, as well as disorders of the blood vessel wall uh, within the brain, um, mitochondrial energy metabolism disorders, and a series of primary neuronal disorders that might give you secondary white matter abnormalities because in the complex interplay between neuronal cells and glial cells, uh, if neuronal cells have a primary dysfunction, they may not signal properly to glial cells to myelinate the brain. Thus, there's a much broader list of disorders that can result in patient presenting with primary white matter abnormalities on an MRI without them necessarily being considered a classic leukodystrophy. This distinction becomes very important when we start to think about how to approach diagnosis in the leukodystrophies. Historically, uh, when we, uh, you know, uh, as recently as about a decade ago, when we were looking at patients who um, had white matter abnormalities on MRI, we used candidate gene approaches. And we would sequence and or test on a biochemical basis a number of different uh, disorders. And at that point, um, that approach of a sequential MRI pattern recognition and clinical features followed by iterative testing uh, resulted in a diagnosis in only approximately half of affected uh, patients. Um, with a high uh, average cost and a long average time. Now, you know, di even if a disorder is not necessarily treatable, a disorder is actually, a diagnosis of a disorder is actually incredibly important to family. This is a little boy whose father was uh, orchestrated one of the first whole genome uh, sequencing approaches for his family at the time, back in 2009. And this is what he sent to all the researchers who were involved in the analysis of that genome, which ultimately led to the child's diagnosis. And you can see how important for his uh, family this diagnosis was, even though this disorder that affected this child did not have a specific treatment. Um, the father uh, uh, felt like it was mission accomplished to have achieved a specific diagnosis. The little boy uh, put a handprint on, um, on the uh, mission accomplished uh, format and um, the father uh, went to the trouble of shipping this uh, all over the world to the researchers who had, been who had been part of the identification of this gene. So when I first uh, uh, started working on the leukodystrophies, uh, importantly, the number of disorders that we had a specific diagnosis for were few and far between. And that's because primarily uh, the disorders that could be diagnosed were diagnosed based on biochemical testing. And they included ALD, Canavan's disease, um, CTX, fucus acidosis, Crabbe, MLD, and Shogun Larsen syndrome. And it's really not until uh, the late 1990s, um, thanks uh, in large part due to MRI pattern recognition, that uh, the number of specific diagnoses that could be characterized uh, increased uh, dramatically. So I want to talk for a minute, although I know we have a dedicated um, 
dedicated talk about this, about how to integrate MRI pattern recognition within uh, the diagnostic strategy for the leukodystrophies. So importantly, right, um, there are such specific real subpopulations within uh, the brain that react differently to the kind of genetic insults that might be seen within leukodystrophies, that there are specific regions of the brain that show signal abnormality in discrete fashions that are recognizable. So I'm also a geneticist, and dysmorphologists um, often say that children with a specific disorder resemble each other more than they might resemble their siblings. Well, there are certain disorders where each uh, uh, patient has such a specific and similar pattern that um, they're highly recognizable even uh, before you've seen the patient. Here's an example, for example, as, as an illustration of three unrelated individuals, all of whom have a, a single uh, genetic uh, disorder, uh, autosomal dominant leukodystrophy uh, in adults caused by, um, with autonomic dysfunction caused by lambda B1 duplications. And you can see the very characteristic uh, pontine and middle cerebellar peduncle signal abnormalities within the uh, brain stems of these individuals that are identical uh, across these individuals. Importantly, right, there are also different regions uh, and uh, that are affected dependent on your age. Uh, Alexander disease is a leukodystrophy that can present very much across the lifespan. And in young uh, children who present with Alexander disease, patients have characteristic and typical MRI features that allow a diagnosis to be made sometimes based on the radiologic uh, features uh, alone. And indeed, even before uh, the molecular etiology of Alexander disease was identified, Mario van der Knapp had uh, created a, um, a series of of diagnostic hallmarks in MRI that had high fidelity for the diagnosis. In children, that includes frontal predominance of white matter abnormalities, signal abnormalities within the brainstem and the basal ganglia, and uh, areas of specific contrast enhancement, as well as um, signal abnormality around the periventricular regions that is uh, different than the deep white matter. Importantly, though, despite this frontal predominance of white matter abnormalities in uh, early onset cases, in patients with uh, older onset Alexander's disease, typically juvenile or adult, although there are still some features that are reminiscent of the early uh, disease features, including uh, brainstem signal, um, brainstem and basal ganglia signal abnormalities, as well as often some capping around the frontal horns, there are also much more significant um, brainstem uh, abnormalities that can sometimes almost seem mass-like and clearly present in a different way than uh, the type 1 uh, Alexander disease. So age can have a significant impact on which cell populations within the brain appear to be involved in specific leukodystrophies. That carries true across other disorders. Um, and here, for example, is a uh, group of disorders, including LBSL and um, HBSL, that are both uh, mutations in tRNA synthetase disorders, DARS and DARS2. One, DARS is in the cytoplasmic compartment, and two, DARS2 is in the mitochondrial compartment. Now, when these um, disorders were first identified, LBSL, was, which is DARS2, was mainly uh, known to be present in older uh, children and adolescents, and those patients presented with multifocal white matter lesions in the supratentorial regions and a series of very selective brainstem signal abnormalities. Several years later, DARS was identified um, as a cause, so this time the cytoplasmic compartment, and in that case, the first patients who were identified were infantile, and they had diffuse uh, T2 signal abnormalities within the supratentorial white matter, and intriguingly, even though it's a different cytoplasmic compartment, they actually had identical brainstem signal abnormalities. This um, information was provided to me by uh, Mario van der Knapp, and she pointed out to me that as uh, we accrued a greater number of cases across the HBSL and LBSL spectrum, the patients with LBSL that presented much younger looked almost identical to the HBSL patients, and the patients with HBSL that presented as older individuals looked strikingly similar to LBSL, uh, demonstrating that in this uh, group of diseases, those patients with uh, early onset had diffuse uh, signal abnormalities in the supertentorial white matter, 
patients with later onset had supratentorial uh, white matter abnormalities that tended to be more multifocal. And the unifying feature across both cytoplasmic and mitochondrial compartment for this DNA synthetase was the selective brainstem and uh, cervical cord signal abnormalities. Thus, the cell population that are involved in uh, this group of lipodystrophies uh, appear to be uh, affected in similar ways, even though the DNA synthetase uh, that is involved is represented in different cellular compartments. So clearly there's something that's unique and exquisite about a certain cell population in responding to certain genetic defects. Now, one uh, specific MRI uh, pattern that's very important to recognize is um, the MRI brain pattern of adrenal leukodystrophy, and that's because adrenal leukodystrophy is one of the few disorders in our group of uh, disorders that actually has uh, an apparently effective treatment. Now, in this uh, condition, in uh, cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy in the, ju in the juvenile patient, um, there's predominant involvement of the occipital region, often first involving the splenium, and importantly, there's an advancing edge of demyelination that is contrast enhancing. Patients who present later in adolescence or young adulthood with cerebral ALD tend to have, instead of an occipital pattern of involvement, a frontal pattern of involvement. Um, but some of the same tenets remain true. There remains uh, significant corpus callosum involvement, and there remains contrast enhancement of, um, of the involved white matter. Importantly, these patients tend to present more with neuropsychiatric manifestation, and this particular patient had had a brother who died of um, childhood onset cerebral ALD, um, but was not recognized uh, for as having cerebral onset ALD, despite presenting with supposed schizophrenia um, to a psychiatric uh, uh, facility, until unfortunately he lost um, uh, gait function and had an MRI, and then it was recognized um, that he had the same disorder as his brother. So you can understand why. When I saw this uh, particular MRI, I said, okay, there's frontal involvement, um, there's contrast uh, at the edge of the demyelination, this looks like adrenal leukodystrophy. But then I noticed a significant sub subcutaneous tissue, and I really began to wonder what type of patient had been sent to me um, in my, in my uh, email. And when I looked at the sagittal images, I was even more confused. And until I read the body of the email that had been sent to me with a question about what the diagnosis might be, that I realized it was an uh, email about a chimpanzee. Um, and uh, ultimately, with the help of uh, Anne Mosier, um, this chimpanzee was successfully diagnosed um, with uh, adrenal leukodystrophy. So I hope I've convinced you that MRI pattern recognition dependent on subpopulations of glial cells within the brain exquisitely responsive to certain genetic uh, defects um, allow one to successfully perform pattern uh, recognition. And, it's, and Mario Van der Knapp in particular has led this field and has um, contributed and provided the identification of a number of disorders based on MRI patterns uh, alone. Along with Mario van der and others, um, there are existent uh, algorithms that allow one to think through uh, different regions of brain involvement and different specific features and the distinction between hypomyelination and um, this or demyelination uh, to allow one uh, to think about how to approach diagnosis based on MRI. Um, and these, for people who are more interested, can be found in a now archived fit version of a gene reviews uh, paper uh, called Leukodystrophy Overview. However, importantly, despite MRI pattern recognition, we were still uh, failing to diagnose the majority of patients with MRI features concerning for leukodystrophy. And in a recent cohort of MRIs in which we performed prospective review of MRI by two uh, neurologists prior to diagnostic testing with whole genome sequencing, we realized that as long as the uh, patient had a canonical leukodystrophy or a mitochondrial leukoencephalopathy, we were pretty good at diagnosing those patients um, with a total of 10 out of 12 individuals being successfully and correctly diagnosed based on MRI pattern recognition and then confirmed by whole genome sequencing. But if patients did not have one of the disorders that fit on the canonical list of disorders or did not have a mitochondrial leukoencephalopathy, all the other uh, disorders that fit better into the concept of genetic leukoencephalopathy, we, were, we got none uh, of the correct diagnoses. And this is most likely because in many of those cases, white matter maladies are secondary and therefore are not affecting discrete subpopulation of oligodendrocytes, but are affecting oligodendrocytes and glial cells overall in the brain in a nonspecific fashion, not permitting uh, MRI pattern recognition. 
Thus, it's not surprising that um, the number of characterized leukodystrophies increased dramatically once we started being able to apply next generation uh, sequencing of the leukodystrophies. And in the remainder of this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the application of next generation sequencing leukodystrophies and how we now uh, integrate next generation sequencing within our diagnostic niche. So the Global Leukodystrophy Initiative was lucky enough to start working um, several years ago uh, at the impetus of some of the family foundations who um, encouraged us to think of uh, the possibility of decreasing the number of patients with unsolved uh, leukodystrophies, um, starting working together uh, to solve uh, leukodystrophies using next generation sequencing. So our first project was based on whole exome sequencing. And at the time, we took a cohort of 191 families who had presented um, to our leukodystrophy clinic with an unsolved uh, leukodystrophy. Of that cohort, 101 families achieved a diagnosis through standard approaches, which was based on MRI pattern recognition plus candidate gene um, approaches. And um, that was pretty consistent with historical norms for solving approximately 50% um, of families uh, using a standard uh, approaches. Of the remaining 91 families, 20 were lost to follow-up before we were able to apply whole exome sequencing, but 71 families underwent whole um, exome sequencing. And diagnostic variants were identified in 30 of, this, of uh, those 71 uh, families, or 42%, achieving an overall diagnostic rate of about 77% for the combination of standard and whole exome sequencing approaches. Importantly, only nine of those 30 um, who were successfully identified were variants classically associated with leukodystrophies, and the remaining 23% remained unsolved at that time uh, based on whole uh, exome sequencing. So of those original 191, 191 families, um, of whom 71 underwent um, exome sequencing, we had 41 of the 71 who remained persistently unsolved. And ultimately, another 41 of those right, underwent genome sequencing um, as a secondary uh, approach. The question there was whether or not genome sequencing could help us solve an additional number of cases. 27% of those remained unsolved despite genome sequencing, but an additional 14 were solved uh, by genome sequencing, or an additional 34%, leading to an overall diagnostic success of about 84%, which is a dramatic increase compared uh, to prior numbers of um, 50%. I think it might be helpful, um, based on the fact that at this point, clinically, most groups have access more reliably to uh, exome sequencing than genome sequencing, however, to understand why pathogenic missense mutations were missed on the first exome. As is now uh, better known, um, a number of, of those are, um, patients who were initially missed on pathogenic missense mutations um, on the first exome were because uh, the variants were in difficult to sequence regions that are historically uh, resistant to um, exome sequencing, such as CPG-rich regions uh, in the or region or mutations in exon 1 or uh, intronic variants. And importantly, uh, there are some uh, disorders within the leukodystrophy family that represent those uh, difficulties. For example, GJC2 has a number of uh, CPG-rich uh, regions that can be resistant to uh, whole exome sequencing approaches. Um, and uh, uh, leukin cellulopathy calcification in cyst has uh, intronic um, has an intronic non-coding uh, variant that uh, uh, needs to be considered uh, for failed uh, exons. Often, however, um, the problem was more that the second variant was a small deletion or duplication or splice site that was not identified on exome, and where the um, the second the first variant that might be uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic within uh, the exome might have been captured was discounted uh, because a second variant was not identified. Um, there are also variants that appear benign, um, but uh, do uh, result in um, uh, changes sufficient within uh, the coding region as to introduce uh, new exons or other uh, disruptions of the protein that cannot be easily predicted from in silico uh, testing. And then uh, there uh, are some patients, obviously, who uh, have novel genes that have not yet been uh, identified and where a reanalysis is necessary at a time when additional patients have been identified and that gene has been known to be associated with um, disease. So after that experience of uh, relative additional uh, success 
of um, genome sequencing after exome sequencing, um, we decided to use whole genome sequencing as an agnostic first approach for patients with an undiagnosed leukocyte dystrophy. And in December of 2015, uh, we uh, decided to enroll in a project that would investigate the use of whole genome sequencing as a first-line diagnostic test in the leukocyte dystrophies to understand how to better integrate uh, these next-generation sequencing approaches within our uh, diagnostic cohorts. The, the design of the study was a randomized crossover uh, design, and participants uh, received either immediate whole genome sequencing as a treatment arm or received in the control arm standard diagnostic approaches for four months, followed by crossover to um, whole genome sequencing for those subjects who did not <laughs> achieve a specific diagnosis um, during the standard um, treatment arm with standard diagnostic approaches. All patients receive CLIA-certified whole genome sequencing within six months of enrollment. We had initially targeted enrollment, targeted enrollment of, um, of um, uh, 200 uh, subjects um, and uh, had uh, 84 individuals who met inclusion criteria of having presumed uh, white matter uh, abnormalities of genetic uh, origin. Uh, ultimately, only 34 of those individuals uh, were fully enrolled uh, and sampled. Um, the numbers of patients who failed uh, final enrollment were patients who had already had nectaration sequencing approaches, um, uh, but none of uh, uh, whom, uh, in an intention treat analysis, necessarily uh, achieved a diagnosis before um, being um, enrolled. And 34 uh, individuals, therefore, included in our interim analysis. Of those patients, about uh, one-third underwent immediate whole genome sequencing and two-thirds underwent standard of care followed by delayed whole genome sequencing according to our planned um, randomization uh, scheme. Importantly, in the patients who underwent uh, immediate whole genome sequencing, none achieved a diagnosis by standard of care, and approximately half, a little bit more than half, achieved a diagnosis by whole genome sequencing. Conversely, in the patients who had standard of care testing, uh, five patients achieved diagnosis by standard of care, and those patients who achieved diagnosis either achieved diagnosis via um, metabolic testing, often ordered with white matter abnormalities, including urine organic acids and um, um, lysosomal enzymes, or had a very salient clinical features such as um, hypodontia for 4H or a very striking MRI pattern such as um, in vanishing white matter disease that permitted early recognition of the uh, diagnosis. Of the remaining of uh, the patients who underwent standard of care followed by delayed whole genome sequencing, 14 achieved a specific diagnosis by whole genome sequencing, while only four remained um, uh, unresolved by the end of the uh, period. Importantly, two patients had been diagnosed prior to full enrollment and were included in the analysis um, according uh, with a diagnosis by standard of care according to an intention to treat analysis. Looking at uh, the analysis, uh, those patients who achieved a diagnosis in the immediate arm typically achieved diagnosis um, within uh, uh, five weeks of enrollment, which is approximately the time of return of the next generation uh, sequencing. However, those patients who underwent uh, delayed whole genome sequencing, um, a subset of them underwent uh, achieved an early and rapid diagnosis by standard of care, mainly because of early return of the biochemical results that diagnosed disorders such as CREP A. Um, but then the remaining of the patients really achieved diagnosis approximately four weeks after the crossover when they underwent whole genome sequencing. Um, and thus, um, in, in survival estimates, um, it became clear that uh, patients really were likely to achieve a diagnosis at the time when whole genome sequencing was implemented. Importantly, um, uh, a majority of patients were solved by whole genome sequencing with a minority uh, solved by standard of care across the entire cohort, and the remaining approximately 20% were not resolved by either um, methodology. Um, also importantly, uh, within the cohort, only 46% of the patients um, were diagnosed with a disorder that was consistent with a canonical leukodystrophy. 15% were diagnosed with mitochondrial leukoencephalopathies, and approximately 40% were diagnosed with non-leukodystrophy genetic etiologies to their disorder. Um, that becomes important when one starts to think about panel testing. For the most part, panel tests um, represent those canonical disorders that are considered leukodystrophies, and thus, it's highly likely that both mitochondrial leukoencephalopathies and genetic leukoencephalopathies would be missed, with a minority of patients only identified and diagnosed based on panel tests. 
So a standard of care approach has identified only five out of 24 cases after six months. And in this cohort also, four to 24 uh, cases or 15% had copy number variations and intronic changes that might not be identified on whole uh, exome sequencing, cert certainly not um, if it was not um, uh, performed in such a way that might be uh, uh, looking specifically for some of those changes. We recognize that enzymatic and biochemical testing, such as lysosomal enzymes, urinogenic acids, or variant fatty acids, is still the most rapid diagnostic tool. However, we make the argument that if biochemical testing is unrevealing, agnostic testing, testing might be best suited to making a rapid diagnosis in this cohort of disorders. And importantly, only 46% of cases were classic leukodystrophies and would be expected to be identified in a panel uh, testing uh, for leukodystrophy genes. So we propose an evidence-based algorithm for how to approach the diagnosis of patients with um, uh, primary white matter abnormalities on their MRI of presumed genetic etiology. So the first thing is that one should consider whether or not the patient has a recognizable clinical or, uh, or MRI pattern. So for example, if a patient um, has uh, specific uh, clinical features or specific MRI features that would allow you to, re to recognize a specific disorder, such as vanishing white matter disease or adrenal leukodystrophy based on established diagnostic criteria in the MRI, then the consideration should be to first uh, pursue um, confirmatory testing for that uh, disorder. However, if either that confirmatory testing is negative or the recognizable pattern MRI does not exist and does not allow you to pursue um, specific etiologic testing for a single uh, disorder, the recommendation is to go ahead and pursue those biochemical tests that can be rapidly returned um, to exclude uh, treatable disorders that might um, need to be diagnosed quickly. And that includes, in this day and age, lysosomal enzymes uh, because of the implications uh, um, for both MLD and crab -A, cholesterol levels because the implications for CTX um, as a treatable entity, urinogenic acids um, for Canavan's disease, even though there's no uh, current uh, uh, recognized uh, treatment for that disorder, and very long chain fatty acids for adrenal leukodystrophy. If those tests are negative and don't achieve a specific diagnosis, um, we would recommend pursuing uh, next generation sequencing uh, sh uh, rapidly within uh, the period of uh, the diagnostic uh, testing to avoid a prolonged diagnostic odyssey for the patient because there's good evidence based on our experience uh, and the experience of others that uh, the patient is most likely to achieve a diagnosis if an agnostic approach is used. So, Thus, in recommendations uh, for the diagnostic approach in uh, leukodystrophies, we recognize that MRI pattern recognition is an important tool in classic leukodystrophies. And this is particularly true for canonical leukodystrophies because it appears that those disorders that have a primary glial cell pathology therefore result in very specific subpopulations and regions of the brain being more involved, creating a recognizable uh, MRI pattern. However, overall, uh, white matter disorders of genetic etiology presenting with an abnormal MRI, um, there are a large number in which the MRI pattern is actually nonspecific and where uh, MRI-based uh, abnormalities in the white matter uh, might represent secondary glial cell changes that would not uh, represent, result in um, uh, a pattern of abnormalities that could be recognized as a specific uh, diagnosis. <laughs> In those cases, either where the MRI pattern is nonspecific or where the expertise of the local individual does not permit recognition of a specific MRI, we recommend using very long chain fatty acids, lysosomal enzymes, and urinogenic acids, as well as cholesterol, if clinically appropriate, to avoid missing a uh, disorder that needs uh, treatment uh, or a disorder that can be rapidly uh, uh, tested and diagnosed uh, based on simple biochemical testing. However, Within the first uh, few weeks of the diagnostic uh, process, if uh, a disorder is not forthcoming either based by clinical recognition or MRI pattern recognition or uh, basic biochemical testing, uh, we recommend uh, sending expanded uh, testing via next generation sequencing, uh, such as whole exome or whole genome uh, testing. We recommend sending a targeted testing or a panel only if you're confident of MRI-based pattern recognition. Um, I hope that's helpful in um, allowing you to 
think about how to approach diagnosis for the patient with an unsolved uh, white matter uh, abnormality. I'm looking forward to Dr. Aras to his talk in greater detail about MRI a pattern because certainly um, that uh, retains a significant role both in uh, the interpretation of variants of uh, a possible significance on uh, broader uh, testing as well as in early recognition of key canonical uh, uh, disorders. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, please feel free, uh, for those of you who have patients that are unsolved, to always reach out to experts uh, who uh, might be able to help you uh, with specific MRI pattern recognition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent lecture. Um, for those that have questions, uh, there is a, a question button would encourage folks to uh, put their questions into that portal. Uh, Dr. Vandiver, we do have one question live. Uh, so the question is, what to do with a patient with developmental delay, MRI suggestive of leukodystrophy, dystrophy, classic lab investigations, and WES negative, no apparent regression, only static encephalopathy? Thank you. Yeah, that's um, a, a very important question. I think, first of all, uh, you know, recent uh, efforts at defining loop dystrophies, including those of the um, uh, uh, Amsterdam Loop Dystrophy Center, have outlined the fact that in order to be considered as having leukodystrophy, you do not need to have a progressive disorder. So that there are disorders that are, that are either so slowly progressive or that are so, um, are even sometimes uh, evolving positively, um, can still have a leukodystrophy. So the fact that your patient did not have a regression does not mean that they're that they do not have a leukodystrophy. Number one. Number two, you know there are a number of mimickers of the um, leukodystrophies that um, are actually true static uh, disorders. There are um, there's a possibility that your patient has a primary developmental disorder um, where white matter um, abnormalities are secondary. Examples of those. Uh, include uh, patients who may have copy number variations and have actually uh, chromosomal uh, disorders where they have true developmental differences. And secondary to those developmental differences, sometimes Frank does genesis in the brain, they can have secondary white matter abnormalities. Many of those patients are static, both clinically and um, in the context of their um, uh, MRI. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, the final piece really uh, touches on how uh, how good our current di diagnostic technologies are, right? So despite the very best efforts of people uh, who uh, um, spend a lot of time thinking about diagnosing leukodystrophies, I would say that on average, probably 10 to 15% of people who we truly think still have a canonical leukodystrophy, um, don't, uh, who truly have a leukodystrophy rather based on um, MRI uh, pattern abnormalities and or genetic leukodystrophy, uh, still may not have a specific etiologic diagnosis. And all of those of us who do this a lot continue to have undiagnosed patients. I would propose that if you're in that situation that you're describing, with classic lab investigation being negative and whole exome sequencing being negative, that you consider referring that patient to a group that might be able to review the MRI and uh, review the patient clinically to see if there's any additional uh, testing, not um, necessarily West-based, but more targeted testing that might um, be helpful in that specific um, clinical situation. I think that uh, um, the um, Global Lucrative Initiative has a number of uh, uh, such uh, sites that might be able to help you to be geographically proximate to the patient. There are also uh, international um, uh, sites, including many of the speakers on this uh, um, group, depending on where your patient is geographically located. And finally, there are also uh, national programs now, like the Undiagnosed Disease Network, that may be able to support you. I hope that's helpful. Uh, and there's um, a and for the technical people, there's someone who just said their audio cut out. Um, hopefully, that's not something that's being experienced broadly. Um, but if it is, please uh, let us know. Yeah, and I, I, in response to uh, that question, I, it is likely a local internet issue, we would recommend if you're on a company VPN uh, that you sort of log out of that company VPN uh, and, and be outside of a VPN network. That is one of the, the troubleshooting things uh, that can be done for the technology. Uh, 
There's a second question. Um, are there any gene panels that could be used as an initial screening tool if MRI pattern is not clearly recognizable? Um, by the way, we have a second question about um, missing audio, just, just uh, FYI. Um, so the question about uh, gene panels is, I think, a, um, um, a very good one. Um, the, the problem with gene panels is that uh, the gene panel is only going to diagnose typically those patients who have um, disorders that are considered canonical leukodystrophies. And um, the, there is a not insignificant overlap between disorders that are readily recognizable in MRI and those canonical leukodystrophies. So I would say that you use a gene panel only when um, it is an expedient way to get a diagnosis for a patient who you think has one of the canonical leukodystrophies, right? Um, in the event that you do not think the patient has one of the canonical leukodystrophies and or you do not recognize a specific disorder, um, I think that, that it's much uh, more likely statistically uh, around 60 plus percent that your patient actually does not have a canonical leukodystrophy and will not be picked up on one of those gene panels because their genetic defect is not represented on that gene panel. So where that leaves you, and, and I think we, we've demonstrated this a couple of studies now, where that leaves you is that if your patient has a disorder that can be recognized on MRI and uh, clinically because they have a canonical leukodystrophy, you're actually probably better off doing targeted testing for that disorder or for the very few genes related to that disorder. If your patient does not have a recognizable disorder, you're very unlikely to diagnose them based on um, a gene panel, and you're better off doing um, an exome-based approach that will allow you to target a much broader uh, range of genes. So I personally almost never use leukodystrophy panels um, because either I will test for a targeted disorder if I'm confident um, of which one it might be, or I look at the MRI and the clinical picture and tell myself this is not one of the canonical leukodystrophies, I don't know what it is, and then I pursue um, uh, exome or genome testing. I hope that's helpful. Are there any other, if there are any other questions, so I encourage you to use the Q&A uh, portal. Otherwise, uh, I think we could move on to our next lecture. Just maybe give it a couple seconds, see if anyone has any uh, last questions on, on this lecture. Yeah, and if people continue to have problems with audio, please um, let us know. All right, well, I think we can move on to the next lecture on uh, radiologic diagnosis. Thank you very much.